So I'd like to, I'm not going to apologize actually. Uh, we originally, Guillaume and I were supposed to present to you about the prevent system, which is basically the, the continuous NAVA mode that Krista presented in the, uh, the rabbits with the CT scan. We have a protocol designed, and we just recently had the ethic, ethical approval, so we're a couple of months delayed. We have no patient data to show you. So after a long discussion, we decided I would talk to you about non-invasive NAVA in the pediatric population. My disclosure is the same as it was this morning. Um, so this might be a little bit of, of a repeat of the adult literature that Luzanne presented. Um, but NIV use is increasing in the pediatric population. Um, in fact, up to 30%, almost 30% of all children requiring mechanical ventilation are being ventilated non-invasively. Um, in bronchiolitis, non-invasive ventilation is now used as the primary mode upon admission, up to 85% of cases. And when I talk about NIV on this slide, I really want to emphasize it's a mix of nasal CPAP and nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation. And we'll get to the NIPPV stuff later. Um, NIV failure uh, occurs in up to 45% of cases. This is a new paper that's just in press, um, which is a multi-center Italian study. And something I wanted to point out that I'm really surprised nobody has asked is the use of nasogastric or orogastric uh, tubes and whether or not they're routinely used. Um, obviously, in the preterm babies who haven't learned to drink or eat yet, they need a, an NG tube down. Um, but the pediatric population, actually, I was a bit uh, curious about that. I asked Guillaume, and he said it's used most of the time. In fact, there's two references now. And speaking with Leo, also, it's routinely used uh, in the adult population. So we've all, all often been asked, well, if you're doing non-invasive ventilation, why do you invasively put down a catheter? But it seems from the literature and from the clinical experience that it is routinely used either for feeding or venting uh, the stomach. Um, on the right is just a summary slide of the, the Wolfler study. Uh, on the left side, you have the NIV rate that they use in different uh, disease conditions in the pediatric. Uh, world and then the failure rate and something I think that maybe we should start looking at is the uh, pediatric ARDS because it looks like they don't use a lot of non-invasive ventilation and when they do there's a high rate of failure so maybe the pediatricians in the room can sit down maybe tonight and discuss some ideas about some feasibility studies in that uh, age group. Okay so why do we have such a high failure of uh, non-invasive ventilation, I'm speaking now about non-invasive positive pressure inf inflation. So we're delivering intermittent inflations on top of PEEP, not nasal CPAP. Um, there are many factors affecting uh, the delivery of this because it is triggered and cycled off. Um, you can imagine, and this is the usual uh, respiratory center, phrenic nerve, diaphragm activity, all the way down to airway pressure, how current technology is controlled uh, for NIPPV, so non-invasive pressure support. And you can see here, you can imagine that when you have a leak around your interface, that this leak will be recognized as patient effort by the ventilator, and this will trigger the ventilator. As well, when you have a leak, the ventilator doesn't recognize that you have stopped breathing, it thinks you're still breathing, so it continues to give air. So not only do you have uh, auto-triggering, but you also get these hang-ups um, in the pressure delivery. Um, so basically, uh, one of the biggest problems with NIPPV is the controller signal, signal that you're using uh, for providing uh, synchrony. And something else that we don't think about very often when we do NIV is we actually have no feedback about how the patient is doing. Once you deliver the assist, are we unloading them? Do we get a response with the bronchodilators or giving caffeine to a premature baby? We have inadequate pneumatic monitoring, so the EDI during other types of non-invasive ventilation or even when a baby's on CPAP, we'll give you some information about that. Um, I won't talk very much about the interfaces, that's another thing. Uh, Howard mentioned that uh, the leaks affect the pressure delivery, you have to go up on your NAVA level, um, and there has been two talks on the upper airways now, so. Those are the things that affect the success of NIPPV. Um, this is a bench study that was done by Dr. Bernstein, and I just wanted to show you with three different uh, types of ventilators, how as you increase the leak, you get an increase in the rate of autocycling. And this is in a bench model, not even with a spontaneously breathing patient. So the leaks are really the major, major impact. Um, you saw this slide uh, today, Dr. Uh, Falou presented it, um, and she touched upon briefly about delivering NIPPV and how it is uh, asynchronous. 
I actually have never read this paper, and I did in preparation for this talk, and I was actually really shocked by the fact that 64% um, of the efforts that these babies make, and this is the transdiaphragmatic pressure, not the EDI, esophageal pressure. This is the ventilator, a bilevel uh, mode of ventilation. But up to 97%, come on, you have a baby trying to breathe and almost no reward at all for their efforts. Um, not only that, but they found that the effort to trigger the ventilator represented nearly one-fifth of their total effort. So asynchrony is present during NIPPV in this population. Um, this is what NIV-NAVA looks like in a pediatric patient. I got the slide from, from Guillaume. Um, it's not really that pretty, because you're all used to square waves, I guess. And, um, but you can see here the diaphragm electrical activity, again, showing the variability we described earlier. And here is the airway pressure. So you can see for small efforts, the baby gets a small amount of assist. And for a bigger effort, the baby gets a bigger breath. And we talked a little bit about the upper pressure limits. Howard uh, mentioned how you mustn't be scared. I was asking Guillaume if this is usual in his practice. Apparently, it's not. Um, but you can see here where the breath was cut off at five below the, uh, the upper pressure limit. So we need to think about how to balance that upper pressure limit with increasing the NAVA level to compensate for the leaks. Um, so let's go through the literature on NIV-NAVA in the pediatric population. So this is the first uh, study that came out. It's a mixed population of kids. They're post-operative children who are um, in acute respiratory failure after their surgery, six babies. And you can see here it's uh, quite a uh, large mixed population, let's call it. And they used only the servo Y ventilator. And um, so as Lise was showing today, for her COPD patients. Um, and also the other results we've seen throughout the day is obviously when you compare pressure support, which is affected by leaks, and NAVA, which is not affected by leaks because we use the electrical signal, that you get a dramatic reduction in the auto cycling, the ineffective efforts, um, the late cycling, and premature cycling. And when you look at an overall asynchrony index, you get a dramatic reduction from 40% of the time being asynchronous to 2% of the time. So that was the very first study in the pediatric population. Um, this is a study that also just came out recently. This is in also post-cardiac uh, patients. They included only babies that were less than five kilos. After they got consent, they put down the catheter and they ventilated the babies in pressure support. This is while they were intubated. Then they extubated and randomized them to either nasal CPAP or NIV-NAVA. Uh, they used uh, nasal prongs, only the servo Y ventilator. And um, they reported only synchrony for the NIV-NAVA arm because there is no synchrony to evaluate on nasal CPAP. So what they found uh, during NIV-NAVA was the asynchrony index was less than 1%. Vigneault showed 2%. The trigger delays were 100, uh, greater than 100 milliseconds in less than 2% of the events. No ineffective efforts and no auto cycling. So very little asynchrony. But what was interesting was when they looked at the respiratory effort that the babies were making after they were extubated, in the first two to six minutes, they found that, and this is a randomized study, so this is, uh, some had nasal CPAP first and some had NIV-NAVA first. And when they put everybody together, they found in the first two to six minutes that they actually got more efficient unloading of the diaphragm uh, during the NIV-NAVA periods. In the early part and then half an hour later as well, though it wasn't significant. So again, the importance of monitoring what you're doing. Are we actually unloading the diaphragm? You can see whether or not this patient needs NIV-NAVA or is nasal CPAP sufficient. Um, this is the study that Guillaume presented. So again, just to show you very quickly, compared to pressure assist control, the asynchrony index is reduced, mainly due to reduction in ineffective efforts, a reduction in auto-triggering. These are uh, kids with severe bronchiolitis who were failing nasal CPAP. But uh, what was interesting is um, at the beginning of the two hours, they did a transcutaneous CO2 measurement and they followed it over the two hour period. And you can see here that during the NIV-NAVA period compared to the uh, pressure assist control period, that they were actually able to reduce the CO2 um, with the improved synchrony. And that's the first study that reported uh, a change in blood gases. Again, it wasn't, clinic it wasn't significant with the statistics, but to me, this looks clinically significant. Um, Guillaume's study, he showed it already again when he had his uh, 13 uh, kids 
uh, eight uh, of which were bronchiolitis pneumonia. You can see here, uh, this is different from the asynchrony index that we've heard about all day today. This is the percentage of time spent in asynchrony. So you can see here, um, I don't see the scale. I'm sorry, Guillaume, do you remember the numbers here? Sorry? 30% um, uh, time spent in asynchrony. One third of the time, these kids are breathing. They're asynchronous compared to when they were put on NAVA, a dramatic reduction of time spent in asynchrony. And I'll just talk a little bit more about this study. This is just to show you what the tracings look like. So here you have, I think this is the baby with um, bronchiolitis on, non, on nasal pressure support compared to nasal NAVA. And you can see here the diaphragm activity. And here you see the airway pressure. There's an improvement in the synchrony, but also the proportionality. You can see here that there's a very variable effort here, which is not rewarded in the pressure support mode. But with the NAVA mode, if a baby decides on this breath, I'm going to breathe less, they get less air. So it's um, matching in timing, but also in the proportionality. You can see here another example of a child in nasal pressure control versus nasal NAVA. And here, I don't know, I, I don't know, we never considered over assist in non-invasive NAVA, we talked a lot about over-assist in invasive ventilation, conventional ventilation. The EDI values in general are higher for non-invasively ventilated patients, but this is the first time I found that we actually may be over-assisting in non-invasive conventional modes. So Guillaume found a very different response in those 13 kids. In some of the kids, when they were initially on, um, on the initial mode of non-invasive ventilation, they were actually uh, deactivated. When they were put on non-invasive NAVA, they were actually um, unloaded. But there was also a group of children who increased their diaphragm activity when they were put on non-invasive NAVA. So what he did was he just basically looked at what was the baseline EDI at the beginning, and what was the change in the EDI when he put them on NAVA. And for those who had a very high respiratory drive, they actually had a reduction of their EDI during NIV-NAVA, which means the diaphragm unloaded them when they needed to be unloaded. Then you have those kids who are clearly over-assisted, so their baseline EDI was very low, and when you put them on NAVA, they no longer were over-assisted. They were able to choose their own pressures, and therefore, they increased their drive to the level that they chose themselves. So it seems that we are able to over-assist during non-invasive ventilation, but we need to have the EDI monitoring to verify what we're doing is what the baby wants. Another uh, example of EDI monitoring during non-invasive in the pediatric setting, here you have a child who just had uh, cardiac surgery, two weeks old. Um, the baby was on invasive NAVA. This is the diaphragm electrical activity. This is a trend over hours. And then they extubated the, ba the baby and put the baby on high-flow nasal cannula, which is a very hot way of delivering assist these days because a lot of people find that the prongs are more comfortable, et cetera, et cetera. But you can clearly see that as time went on, first of all, there's a huge increase in the tonic activity of the diaphragm, but also the baby started to have very high respiratory drive, which increased over time. So what they did was they decided to put non-invasive NAVA on this child, and you can see immediately that they were unloaded and that the tonic, they were able to recruit themselves and that the tonic activity came down. So to me, this is a very, another example of where the monitoring of the diaphragm activity is important. And this is my summary slide. Um, I had these hats made. It says, I'm an NAVA baby. I'm very proud of that. Um, we all know asynchrony now occurs in pediatric NIV. Non-invasive NAVA eliminates the asynchrony. I mean, we go down to 2% in asynchrony. Um, Non-invasive NAVA has the potential to prevent intubation when nasal CPAP fails. And also, the EDI monitoring is useful for diaphragm and loading during non-invasive ventilation. And that's it. Yep. Thank you.